Hello and welcome to part 2 of my Jack the Ripper special. Before getting into this, I would suggest that you read the description for part 1, narrated in the preview, if you haven't already done so. This is the murder map from part 1. I have no doubt that commercial Ripperology is fully aware of the theory for making Joseph Levy and Henry Harris prime suspects, but they choose to largely ignore this, while even misinforming the public, for reasons I can only assume are intended to steer attention away from them. While still happily promoting suspects that are, quite honestly, utterly ridiculous, and for which there is little or, very often, no linking evidence. I attempted to add the suspects I am championing to Wikipedia, but the entry was rescinded within literally minutes. Interestingly, Wikipedia and Casebook.org have the same total of 31 suspects, but not the exact same 31, while JackTheRipper.org have just 14, as of December 28, 2022. There are hundreds of books about this case, and likewise, a great many purported suspects. The suspects I am discussing here came to my attention a few years back, in the form of a book published in 2017. I have been extensively researching ever since. I have collaborated with the author of that book, but this isn't just my rehash of that book. I have added significant additional evidence, that is as verifiable as is reasonably possible, corrected some errors, and striven to avoid over-speculation to reinforce my arguments. The circumstantial evidence is strong and bolstered by graphical presentation in the form of maps, see part 1 for full graphical presentation, while all supporting evidence is presented for the purpose of viewer scrutiny and independent research. Whether you agree with the assertion that this solves the case or not, isn't the primary point though. The question I want to ask is, why have we never heard about any of this before? Because we should have, and that is true of other suspects too, some of which I will cover at the end of this video. Information provided to the public is lacking in suspicious ways, and skewed to lead away from the truth. We can look at this one of three ways, either it's deliberate, inept, or just lazy. None of which is impressive. This is not a conspiracy theory, because there is no organized conspiracy, just many independent parties with a vested interest, working in similar ways to mislead the public. Obviously, there is no issue with making money from true crime, but commercial ripperology isn't always being entirely honest, it has become a bit of a scam. You could say we're being rippered off. In short, they are often being disingenuous, at best. I am focusing on the two major Ripper websites, but the general criticisms I am making apply to the whole industry. There are too many books and too many revisions to be able to fairly cite any allegations broadly across the whole industry, not to mention the cost of acquiring so many books. What Casebook.org and JackTheRipper.org provide is a representative overview. More importantly, they are the go-to place for the armchair detective and casual true crime lover, who will assume what they are told is full and accurate, because they are viewed, present themselves as, and probably are, experts. However, watch to the end and learn of a serious faux pas by Casebook which I have uncovered. Before presenting all the record evidence, I would like to examine the crux of this theory, which is what really happened in Duke Street and Mitre Square on September 30, 1888. Firstly, there was a lot of errors in the media, and possibly incorrect information given at the inquests. The three witnesses, Joseph Hyam Levy, Henry Harris, and Joseph Lawend, claimed to have left the Imperial Club and entered Duke Street. They noticed a man and woman standing on the corner of the synagogue, where church passage led into Mitre Square. They all admitted seeing Eddowes with a man, but claimed they did not see his face. The location of the Imperial Club is a bit sketchy. The currently recognized location makes sense based on the 16 to 17 Duke Street that was reported. It must have existed. However, the census and tax records seem to imply that 16 and 17 Duke Street were residential. Perhaps it didn't have a number and was sandwiched in between 16 and 17 Duke Street. The census recorders didn't always document non-residential buildings. Although, 
I was unable to find a tax record for the Imperial Club. The 1881 and 1891 censuses omit 16 Duke Street, so perhaps this was the location. Law N's general description of the unknown man was withheld in court at the request of the police, it is a mystery as to why, particularly as a description, credited to Law End, was reported by the press in the Times on October 2, 1888, which was, of shabby appearance. About 30 years old and 5 foot 9 inches in height, of fair complexion and wearing a red neckerchief and a cap with a peak. Which begs a question, why did they previously claim not to have seen the man's face and imply it was too dark to see any detail? Incidentally, Jacob Levy would have been 32 in 1888. Apart from vague descriptions, they had little to say, in fact, Harris didn't even appear at the inquest and was particularly unhelpful, while Levy had little of value to impart. The descriptions that were reported were not all entirely consistent either. An important error that appears almost universally in the records is Harris's first name, it was given as Harry, not Henry. Harry may have been how he was known, but his name was definitely Henry, that is well known. Also, Harris's address is given as Castle Street Whitechapel, but there was no Castle Street in Whitechapel. Either, Harris deliberately gave misinformation, or everyone got it wrong. Although it is not known for certain where Harris was living in 1888, his father's address of 34 New Castle Street is significant. The electoral registers for 1888, i.e. published in 1889, show that, unless Harris was not living in Whitechapel or Aldgate in 1888, which is exceedingly unlikely, then he must have been living either at 34 New Castle Street or 111 Wentworth Buildings. We see from the 1891 and 1901 census that Harris is recorded at 34 New Castle Street. A search of the 1889 Aldgate Electoral Register for Henry Harris shows no matching results, a search of the 1889 Whitechapel Register indicates two matches, the one for 54 Mansell Street also appears on the 1892 list, i.e. for 1891. But we know that the Eddowes Henry Harris was already living at 34 Newcastle Street in April 1891, according to the census. If he wasn't living at 111 Wentworth Buildings in 1888, then he wasn't a head of household, so logically must have been living with his father. These are the only realistic conclusions that can be drawn. One address is absolutely damning, while the other is highly suspicious, and coupled with an extraordinary coincidence. I will add a footnote here though, making sense of the electoral registers for the relevant period is no easy task, there are a lot and it is complicated, also some records were lost in the distant past, so cross-reference with the 1881 and 1891 census is also required. Which also aren't 100% complete. So, it is a complicated picture to puzzle together, but the conclusions I am drawing are very reasonable, nonetheless, and arrived at through meticulous research. These are the relevant pages from the relevant district where he would be listed, were he living in Catherine Will Alley, which was in Aldgate, which proves that Harris was not living there in 1882, 1884, 1886, or 1887. To go any further into this would be incredibly complex and tedious, that is not an exaggeration. But anyone can try to prove this premise is unfounded. In fact, I challenge anyone to do so and present their requisite proof. I am perfectly willing to concede to truth. The incorrect address for Harris has persisted, albeit as a genuine quote, but no one bothers to point out the discrepancy. This could be very significant, because, if nothing else, Harris may have been lying, just like Lechmere. That in itself doesn't prove anything, but it doesn't exactly go in his favor either. Ripperology insists on perpetuating these inaccuracies and misdirecting the public. For the record, there was a Castle Street in Aldgate, not Whitechapel, which was off Bevis Marks, a little further down from Duke Street, but by 1888 it was called Goring Street, and still exists today. The 1889 Booth map still has it as Castle Street, but the tax records prove the name change. 
there is absolutely no evidence that Harris ever lived there and everyone agrees his father's address was 34 Newcastle Street. I believe he may have known about this Castle Street and was being deliberately misleading, though, to be fair, not necessarily because he was the Ripper. If Harris was living with his father, he would not appear in the electoral registers because he wouldn't be the head of household, i.e. the rent payer. While this could be inferred as suspicious in itself, it's not enough to decide whether they were just innocent witnesses, or something else. The Evening News reported on the October 9th, in regard to Joseph Levy. Mr. Joseph Levy is absolutely obstinate and refuses to give us the slightest information. He leaves one to infer that he knows something, but that he is afraid to be called on the inquest. Hence he assumes a knowing air. Perhaps, he was afraid of being recognized himself. Another report reads that Levy said to Harris, Here, I'm off. I don't like the look of those people over there. I won't like going home by myself at this hour of the morning. The Ripperology Cooperative doesn't generally include the full quote, the I'm off bit is omitted. I wonder why. This quote can be found in the Echo newspaper of October 11, 1888, which is on the Casebook website, but to find it requires trawling through a great deal of newspaper quotes, unless you know where it is. JackTheRipper.org don't appear to have any media reports for the Eddowes murder, or in fact, very much at all. At the Eddowes inquest, the coroner, asking about the lighting in the passage, inquired, your fear was rather for yourself? To which Levy replied, not exactly. I wonder what he meant by that. If he meant the woman, how gallant of him to be off. Or perhaps he already knew what was going to happen to her. There is another interesting article in the Evening News of October 9, 1888 which states that Henry Harris, they actually got his name right, is described as the most communicative of Harris and Levy. That's odd, because thereafter, the opposite was always true. So, what did he have to communicate? Well, just that he was of the opinion that neither Levy nor Lawen saw any more of the man with Eddowes than he, which was the back of the man. Helpful. Actually, Law End did see a little more than that, as per the descriptions reported. Levy was subsequently more communicative, but had little to impart. Law Wendt has been reported as claiming that Levy and Harris had hung back a little from him, while conversing secretively, which is why he looked backward and got a reasonably good view of the man, though not his face apparently. It was also reported that Law Wendt did not seem bothered about the murders, it's not known why though. Note the quote, on screen, in the previous sentence. He could not be led, but was evidently inconsistent. These things in themselves are not necessarily suspicious, but they could be, one way or another. Of course, Lawend is just a witness, so nothing to see here, right? Where Levy and Harris lived, and therefore, their route home, is incredibly coincidental. The Ripper would have been about 15 minutes behind them, if we believe their account. Unless, they were the Ripper. And, would a butcher, whose shop is on Petticoat Lane and has lived his entire life in a rough area, be the type to be scared of a rough character? Something worthy of note about Casebook.org is that on their Edo's victim page, they do not mention the apron piece found in the entrance to 108 to 119 Wentworth buildings. I find that odd. Lawend was living in Dalston in 1888, but his brother, Leopold, lived at 3 Tenter Street South, and Lawend had lived next door at number 2, up until at least 1884. The earliest record found for 45 Norfolk Road is 1890, i.e. for 1889. But as this was the address he gave in 1888, he must have been living there by then. Unfortunately, the public records are incomplete. So, with this information, we can start to analyze what could have happened after they entered, and exited, Duke Street. Lawend would have been walking up the high street, unless he was getting a cab to Dalston, at least as far as the Middlesex Street Mansell Street turnings, and then on to his brother's home. In fact, all three could have walked that way,
probably the safest route, with Levy turning into Middlesex Street and Harris continuing a little further to either Golston Street or Newcastle Street, depending on exactly where he was heading. This would seem the best route all round. Which is why it is strange that Levy implied he was going to walk home alone, which logically would mean he planned crossing into Houndsditch, via the Duke Street dogleg and cutting through. But, he also said I'm off, implying that he was about to walk off alone. It doesn't quite add up. We don't know which route any of them took. We don't know exactly what happened after Levy said this. We don't know whether anyone even asked. Nothing regarding this was reported. And even if it had been, it wouldn't necessarily be the truth. Perhaps this was why they were being difficult, so as to avoid more searching questions. Once we stop seeing Levy and Harris as just reluctant witnesses, a wholly different scenario may be inferred. This is what may have happened, Levy suggests to Harris, or vice versa, that they should kill Eddowes. Plying her trade right next to the synagogue where Harris, and his sister, and probably other friends and family were married, would have likely made them very angry, especially if they were the Ripper. Levy hurries away toward Houndsditch, via the Duke Street dog leg. Harris then chases after him. La Wen then swiftly walks up Duke Street and into the High Street. Except, Levy and Harris don't immediately go home. They wait in Duke Street for La Wen to turn into the High Street, then return to Church Passage. Presumably they wait for the man to emerge and go on his way. It wouldn't matter if the man saw them, because they already had their story, while if the man came forward, he would likely become the prime suspect and could easily end up on the gallows himself. Levy would, no doubt, do the butchering, he certainly had the skills, while Harris could act as lookout and assistant. So, in this scenario, most of what they said would have been true. Levy would have a knowing air, if he was the Ripper. Harris is the less chatty type and just wants to keep Shtum. La Wend has no idea what really went on. This is entirely possible. Yes, it's supposition, but every suspect is supposition, except, in this case, as with Lechmere, we have a tangible link to the crime scene within minutes of the murder. Not only that, we also have a second location connected to the crime which is suspiciously close to where they lived, possibly, at the entrance to the building where one of them actually lived. Harris was almost certainly following the same path as the Ripper, maybe because he was the Ripper, or his assistant. Of course, the graffito in the entrance of 108 to 119 Wentworth buildings is a bizarre element in this crime, the Jewess are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. Regardless of what suspect is championed, it is hard to reconcile. The apron piece was possibly used to wrap Edo's kidney, so why discard that? While the message on the wall is just downright cryptic, badly written and ambiguous. What purpose did it serve, whoever wrote it? I do understand the decision to erase it though, Golston Street acted as an overspill for the Petticoat Lane Market, which would have been bustling with people before very long. That said, was the market allowed to operate on a Sunday? There would be a substantial Jewish contingent, so maybe the police turned a blind eye. What the police did not do however, was interview the occupants of 108 to 119 Wentworth buildings, at least not on the day of the murder. If they ever did, we don't know who they spoke to, what the police asked or what the tenants told them. The block was occupied by Jewish artisans, many of them immigrants, some of whom may not have spoken much English. The police seemed to have regarded the entrance to the building merely as a hiding place, slash escape route. I don't suppose anyone ever realized that a Henry Harris lived at number 111, coincidence or not. In this scenario, Levy, Harris, and La Wend had been at the Imperial Club that night, before happening across Eddowes. If La Wend was completely innocent, it would mean that the Elizabeth Stride murder may not have been a Ripper murder. For that to be the case, there would need to be a bit more going on, possibly involving La Wend. I will examine this shortly.
What about motive, or rather motivation? Clearly the Ripper is a psychopath of some sort, but was not an out-of-control lunatic. Whoever the Ripper was, they were able to blend in. Superficially, they would be normal, possibly even charming, they could have friends and family that would be completely unaware of the darkness they were hiding. A sociopath would probably be an appropriate analysis of their personality. Think of Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, etc. We don't know a lot about Levy and Harris, other than they were Jewish. Lawend was a Polish Jewish immigrant, arriving in London around 1871. He married Annie Rosenthal in 1873, the marriage register incorrectly states Lowenthal. They had 12 children, all of whom were still alive in 1911. Unofficially, he referred to himself as Lavender, which appears on the 1911 census. Levy and Harris both married in 1866, but in contrast to La Wend, Levy had no children and Harris had only one that appears to have died very young, probably as an infant, or was possibly a stillbirth. This child never appears in any public records, other than the 1911 census. Casebook failed to mention this, but then they have the wrong marriage anyway. Tracing the birth-slash-death registration for this child would be a considerable challenge and probably very expensive, but the 1911 census is not difficult. Another detail that case book get completely wrong is Henry Harris's wife. According to them, he probably married a Rebecca Harris, but this is easily disproved from the Church of England marriage record, no marriage certificate required. In reality, he married Rebecca Benjamin, and as I stated in Part 1, they married at the Great Synagogue in Duke Street, Aldgate. Levy married Amelia Lewis, who lived in Mitre Street. The certificates are difficult to read and won't show up well on this video, but I provide them for scrutiny. The certificate for Harris's sister is easier to read. The General Register Office agree that they do say Great Synagogue, if you're in any doubt. Levy was a lifelong butcher, as was his father, and uncle, also called Joseph, who was the father of Jacob Levy, more on him later. He lived at 1 Hutchinson Street in Aldgate, where he also had his shop, which would have been on the corner of Middlesex Street, i.e. Petticoat Lane. He lived there until sometime after 1892, by 1901, he had moved to 124 Mild May Road in Dalston. Lawend lived at 116 Mild May Road from about 1894. Middlesex Street was the border between Aldgate and Whitechapel. Most of his family lived in Whitechapel. His occupation is, of course, a good fit for the Ripper. But, equally, most butchers are not psycho murderers. What we do know is that all three men were practicing Jews, albeit probably not strict. Marriage was sacrosanct, so separation, and especially divorce, would be difficult, given they lived in a large Jewish community, composed of many extended family members. And, children would have been an expectation. So, while we can only speculate, that's all anyone can ever do with any suspect. So, perhaps Levy and Harris had unstable marriages, perhaps they had unreasonable sexual demands, or their wives had issues, psychologically or physically, in respect to their sex life. It is probable that there was stress in the relationships. The marriages may have been arranged, a potential cause of disharmony, if ever there was one. A lack of children would likely be blamed on the women, regardless of the true cause. This could be the driving force behind a hatred of women. The Ripper clearly had deep-seated issues with women, attacking the genital area, removing the uterus, among other things. Most of the women murdered were a similar age to their wives. Obviously, there is no tangible evidence to support this, but there may be reasons to believe that the Harris marriage at least, was troublesome. The censuses for 1871, 1881 and 1891 suggest something strange going on. On the 1871 census, there is a curious correction to Rebecca's marital status, it looks like unmarried or widow, overwritten. However, the entry for the couple above theirs, 
also looks a bit strange, that says Mar, so possibly just bad writing. Their place of birth though, is given only as England, which isn't normal. The 1881 census does at least give London as their place of birth, but their ages are about seven years out. Recording of ages could vary a little, but rarely that much. The 1891 census seems to indicate that the census collector was having some major problems getting the information, the record wasn't completed. What is recorded is odd. Henry is given as single, while his wife's name is given as hubba, and the marital status is incomplete. The grandchild and servant's details were not completed either. Whatever was happening is unusual because they rarely failed to complete the form. In 1901, the census is correctly completed. Henry may have been suffering from ill health as he died from kidney disease in 1904, he was probably a more subdued personality. What his death certificate shows is that his brother-in-law was present at death, not his wife, that's not necessarily of any significance, but it does show that he was close to Ezekiel Moss, his sister Rebecca's husband. That's important in respect to where his sister lived after she married. Hubba is clearly the term used for Harris's wife. It is unique in the records and is a mystery. Hubba Hubba is a now outdated US slang term used for an attractive woman, but this didn't come into usage until well into the 20th century, probably during the Second World War. The best derivation I could find is from the German Hubsche, which means beautiful. The Harris family may have been of German origin. I suspect if that was the intended usage, that it was not said as a compliment, given the other discrepancies in that census record, nor was it appropriate for the census and should not have been accepted. Harris was a furniture dealer in the 1880s. He probably dabbled in other things, as he was sometimes referred to as a general dealer, his father was likewise. This probably involved traveling around to some extent, at least within the general area where he lived. Their close friend Lawend was involved in the tobacco industry, mainly as a dealer. Although I would not rule him out, and it is worth noting that he was a commercial traveler, my personal instinct is that Lawend was not involved in the murders. He may have had suspicions, which he no doubt would have kept to himself. That probably applies to the entire Jewish community in the area of Whitechapel where they lived. Many Jews were recent immigrants, some possibly illegal, and probably couldn't speak much English. They undoubtedly would have maintained a low profile. The London-born Jews would be fearful of reprisals. The Jewish community, as still largely today, would have been a tribal group with an inbuilt group preservation instinct. Wentworth Buildings was an entirely Jewish occupancy. In fact, Golston Street was predominantly Jewish. What I am about to suggest may seem somewhat politically incorrect, but this relates exclusively to the situation in Whitechapel in the 1880s. The Jewish community were probably mostly composed of practicing Jews. The Jewish religion regards prostitutes as the lowest of the low, an abomination in the eyes of God. While they may not have actively supported the murders, most may not have been overly concerned about the well-being of loose heathen women. That did appear to be Lawen's attitude, as was reported. The remaining question of whether the Harris-Levy scenario could include the Stride murder, is obviously highly speculative, just like every other Ripper theory. What is known is that there was about an hour between the Stride and Eddowes murders. It was claimed at the time that it would take about 15 minutes to reach Mitre Square from Berner Street. That could be critical. It has been long debated what the Ripper did in that window of time. Though it is a stretch, Levy and Harris could have made it to the Imperial Club, met up with La Wend, stayed for 30 to 40 minutes, then all left together, just as they claimed. It's possible. We know that there may have been two men involved in Stride's murder, that could have been Levy and Harris. Would anyone at the club come forward if they knew anything? I doubt it, and there is no evidence to suggest that the police were rigorous enough to check out their alibi, as they didn't need one, they were just witnesses weren't they? A Louis Deem Schutz, aka Louis Deem Schitz, and other variants, was the one to discover Elizabeth Stride's body.
he was the steward of the Jewish working men's club that was situated at the end of Dutfield's yard, it was still open for business at the time of the murder. I mention this partly because Jack the Ripper.org feature deem shuts as a potential suspect. Now, I'm not saying that's unreasonable, but it does raise the question, why include him, but not Levy and Harris as potential suspects? Casebook list deem shuts as a witness and have a surprising amount to say about him, certainly more than they do about Harris, despite deem shuts being mostly missing from the public records. Interestingly they mention he assaulted a policeman in 1889, which you might imagine would be justification for him being a suspect. JackTheRipper.org don't mention this or provide any evidential reasons for making him a suspect. Talk about inconsistent. Continuing with the Stride murder, I think it is also a bit of a coincidence that both Stride and Edo's murders were perpetrated very close to a Jewish men's club. It is obviously pretty important to the Ripper case, so you would imagine that a witness who actually saw the man who killed Stride might be worth mentioning. Israel Schwartz barely gets a mention on casebook.org, in stark contrast to Jack the Ripper.org, but he almost certainly got a look at the face of the man that killed Stride. He claimed that another man emerged in the street, after he passed Dudfield's yard, when Stride's assailant shouted Lipsky. Schwartz claimed that the other man who emerged in the street, followed Schwartz for a considerable distance. JackTheRipper.org, to their credit, do have a good account of this under the Stride murder. Chief Inspector Swanson wrote that the police apparently do not suspect the second man, but their reasoning is unknown, and it's odd that he is referring to the police in the third person. Schwartz was a Jewish immigrant himself, so no surprise he wasn't very cooperative with the police and did not attend the inquest. Harris and Levy appeared at the Aldgate inquest and not the Whitechapel inquest for Stride, so Levy and Harris would know there would be little chance of them bumping into Schwartz, even if he had attended, assuming they killed Stride that is. The term Lipsky referred to an East End Polish Jew called Israel Lipsky who was hanged for the murder of a pregnant young woman. He went to the gallows in August 1887. He killed the girl by making her drink nitric acid. Whether he was really guilty is debatable, but the term came into use for a short time after. It has been suggested that the killer shouted Lipsky as a Jewish slur to scare Schwartz, which it certainly did. However, I think that the killer could have been referring to himself. Schwartz's description doesn't sound all that like a Jew, but it's not that detailed. Perhaps they disguised themselves a little, that would make sense and could explain some of the witness descriptions of men seen with the victims. The man Schwartz saw well, was relatively short, while the other man was quite tall. This also matches up with inconsistent descriptions. Whether it is relevant or not, is another matter. The Stride murder as a Ripper case was controversial at the time, and remains so. If we consider Levy and Harris as the Ripper, there may be more, albeit rather tenuous, circumstantial evidence to support that. I will come to that later. I think I have established that Levy and Harris are credible suspects, at least as credible as Charles Lechmere and Jacob Levy, who are among the most credible. It is a fact that a lot of the details relating to Charles Lechmere, Levy, Harris, Lawend, and Israel Schwartz, had largely been suppressed by Ripperology until the 1990s. I recall a TV documentary that used CGI representations of some of the murder scenes to demonstrate what it would have been like in 1888. This was the first time I heard a lot of the details about Lechmere and Schwartz, and they have only been begrudgingly trickled into the narrative over the passing years. As I have already demonstrated, Ripperology likes to keep some information quiet or hidden, and to provide misleading or incorrect information to steer the would-be detective in the wrong direction, or a dead end. Only the most determined researcher will find any of these details, the casual would-be detective will not have all the important facts provided to them, and will get bogged down in a sea of extraneous trivia. Returning to something that I also recall from that 1990s documentary, forgive me if it was some other documentary, was a statistical assessment of where the murderer may have lived, courtesy of the FBI. 
This only included the canonical five and can only ever be an estimate anyway. But, this analysis identified Flower and Dean Street as the most likely location of the Ripper's residence. That's not far from Newcastle Street. If the George Yard and Castle Alley locations had been included, maybe the epicenter would have been Newcastle Street, or somewhere close and equidistant to Hutchinson Street. I do disagree with the FBI analysis in 1988. The description of the killer does not seem to be entirely correct in my view, perhaps that's just bias on my part. Profiling does have its place and can be useful, but cannot be considered wholly reliable. However, it could fit a little mentioned potential suspect called Robert Mann, which JackTheRipperTour.com do have an article about. I'm not sure whether their photo is verifiably genuine. He is certainly an interesting suspect and should be more prominently featured throughout commercial ripperology. Of course, all of these type of analyses are subjective and easily skewed by inclusion, or exclusion, of details, some of which may be incorrect. That description doesn't fit with Israel Schwartz's description, nor the impressions that have been created from the contemporary witness evidence. Although, none of those may be correct either. The Eddowes murder is different from all the others in that there are two crime scenes associated with it. As I demonstrated in Part 1, Harris's route home could take him into Goulston Street, and that Newcastle Street, which we know to be Harris's father's address, at the very least, and 1 Hutchinson Street, on Middlesex Street, are the adjacent roads, which literally sit smack bang in the middle of them. Technically, Castle Alley is between Newcastle Street and Goulston Street, but is not a residential thoroughfare, and Old Castle Street does not come between them. The time frame is also perfectly aligned with what we know. Incidentally, a policeman did come across two men in Wentworth Street that night, after the alarm had gone out. However, they apparently gave a good account of themselves. If only we knew who they were. Of course, if Harris really was living at 111 Wentworth buildings, that surely would be game over. Unfortunately, it cannot be definitively proved. Wentworth buildings, built in 1887, still exist today, at least superficially. The outer shells are original, but they have been completely remodeled internally. The original apartments, probably modernized at some point, were still in official use until 1976, apparently, they were occupied until 1982 by the Bangladeshi community. At this time the entrances were bricked up. The remodeling was carried out in the 1990s. Consequently, the entrance to 108 to 119 still exists, but only as an external structure. It forms part of a restaurant and is a window. You could stand on the spot where the graffito and apron piece were, but that part of the building no longer exists per se. This is the only structure directly connected to the canonical five murders that still exists. The Google Earth image from 1945 shows Newcastle Street. A bomb caused extensive damage during the Blitz. Note that Old Castle Street had incorporated Castle Alley by 1945 there was always a strong suspicion that the Ripper was Jewish. Perhaps there was a reason for that. Interestingly, the Jewish Sabbath, Shabbat, is from Friday sunset until Saturday sunset. Of course, we can't know how strictly Levy and Harris observed this, but it may be significant. Of the ten murders I am including in this analysis, four were on a Friday morning, one each on a Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, Stride and Eddowes was on a Sunday and only one was on a Saturday, Annie Chapman, just around sunrise. So, apparently, only one was during Shabbat, and none on a Thursday. Were it not for the Chapman case, which is curious for several reasons, that might have meant something. Of course, ripping up women isn't permitted under Jewish tradition either. So, I don't know that we can really read anything into that, one way or the other. It's interesting to note how Casebook.org and JackTheRipper.org deal with the Eddowes case. Just as with the Ripperology Collective's publications, a lot of useless information is given, while a huge amount is just never mentioned, 
and surely, someone would know about a Henry Harris living at 111 Wentworth Buildings in 1888. A coincidence that is indisputably noteworthy, isn't it? For a long time Harris's father's address was not given in the literature, while Castle Street Whitechapel never existed, did no one ever check that? I think we can assume that the address that Harris was really referring to, was his father's, irrespective of whether he was actually living there at that time. Additionally, giving his father's address would not necessarily prompt anyone to check where that was. As it no longer exists, finding it is not easy. That combined with the incorrect first name of Harry, made it exceedingly difficult for the casual researcher to trace Harris. He is made to seem irrelevant, but at the same time include the quote that he was the most communicative, which while being a genuine newspaper quote, is evidently not true, he provided nothing. Casebook continue to give an incorrect marriage for Harris, have they never checked this? Have they stuck their head in the sand and started singing, so they can't hear the truth? JackTheRipper.org give absolutely no information about these three characters, despite stating that Lawend may have seen the Ripper's face, not important then? I think he saw the Ripper's face a great deal. Why does Ripperology delve so deeply into every crevice of this case, providing reams of, albeit interesting, utterly useless information, but won't tell the truth about the Edo's three? Why does Casebook.org present Israel Schwartz, a man who may have seen the face of the Ripper, as an inconsequential footnote. True, there isn't much known about Schwartz and he is not a suspect, but there is a wealth of information to be found about Levy and Harris. Why do these websites omit, or at least, appear to hide, the part of Levy's quote where he says I'm off? They are deliberately misdirecting the viewer away from any suspicion that could be leveled at Levy and Harris. However, one quote slipped through in Case Book's article on suspect Hyam Hyams, more on this later. That particular quote comes from the Daily News on October 12, 1888 and reads, I don't like going home by myself when I see these sort of characters about. I'm off. This variation of the quote is even more damning in regard to Levy's subsequent actions. Casebook.org do give quite a lot of background on Law Wend but this has little value. Levy himself doesn't get much coverage. Most importantly, it doesn't mention the relevance of his wife's, Amelia Lewis, family home, the one in Mitre Street, whereas with Hyam Hyams, the family connection to Mitre Street is cited as significant, which will be quite amusing, later on. You might notice that the surname Levy, Lewis, Harris, Abrahams, and Hyams crop up a lot in the Whitechapel and Aldgate records, there is a good chance they were all related. Ripperology don't want you to know that Harris married at the Great Synagogue in Duke Street, the one next to Church Passage, because then you might get suspicious. They don't want you to know about his and his wife's families and the locations where they lived. They don't want you to know that Harris's sister Rebecca married Ezekiel Moss, at the Great Synagogue, and where they lived, especially in 1881, when they lived at 78 Commercial Street nearly directly opposite Dorset Street. They don't want you to know the addresses associated with Harris's parents, like 15 Princess Street. Incidentally, the occupation given for Joseph Harris on Rebecca Harris's marriage certificate is dealer, if you're wondering, the writing is terrible. Commercial Ripperology has made the Ripper case their speciality, their field of expertise. We know everything about the victims, from the name of their sister's dog, to what the dog liked to eat, but they don't provide anything useful about the Edo's three. All that background detail might be very interesting from a social history perspective, but it tells you nothing about the murders. I think we know these women were unfortunate wretches, without knowing their life history. It doesn't add anything to the case, unless you want to believe in fairy tales involving a naughty prince or a supposedly insane royal surgeon, etc. All that is about is weaving a morbid fantasy set in an atmospheric location. It's not real and doesn't help in any way. Yes, the victims should be remembered and pitied, but that won't solve the case. There is no personal link between them that is of any significance,
they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time, like most non-domestic murder victims. While the streets in Whitechapel and Aldgate were dark, dingy, and smoggy, they were not quite so different to today as they would like you to think. As has always been believed, the Ripper knew their way around and there were always plenty of escape routes. The victims were essentially stalked. It was a carefully orchestrated pursuit, most of the time at least. True, sometimes their compulsion may have nearly led them to the gallows, but somehow, luck was on their side. If we return to the first canonical murder of Mary Nichols, the pre-1990s impression was that Charles Lechmere discovered her body at the same time as Robert Paul, the other man at the scene, who actually stumbled across Lechmere crouching over her body. For many decades, no one bothered to check who he actually was, or discover that he had given the false name of Charles Cross, at least, that is what we are led to believe. Even if he had called himself that for a period, he certainly didn't at the time. Yes, he gave his true address, 22 Doveton Street. He didn't really have much choice by that point. The day I first heard about that I sat up in amazement and said to my then wife, how come we've never heard about any of this before? And we're still not always getting the full picture. Beside Lechmere's rather dodgy involvement, the other thing about the Nichols murder that was totally misleading, was the idea that the killer would have had difficulty escaping, in the little time we presume they had before Lechmere's footsteps would have been heard getting ever closer. I was under the impression that he would have to walk all the way to the bottom of White's Row and that there were no other escape routes. For clarity I am switching to the 1900 map, Buck's Row has been renamed Derward Street, but otherwise the layout is the same as the 1889 map. As can be seen, there are numerous escape routes, including three shorter routes into Whitechapel Road, one literally just around the corner. Casebook.org might defend their position by citing that they have included Jacob Levy in their list of suspects, something which Jack the Ripper.org has not. Why? Well, although he is a credible suspect, there isn't the geographical evidence for him, and of course, his only connection to the crime scenes is, therefore, Joseph Levy, his paternal cousin. So, what this may be achieving is to camouflage Joseph Levy from the eye of suspicion himself. Remember, he was a Jewish butcher, just like Jacob. True, he didn't die in an lunatic asylum, but as I contend, the Ripper probably wasn't a complete madman. Jacob Levy was known to be insane as he was committed to an asylum in August 1890, suffering from syphilis, which he is presumed to have caught from a prostitute. After this incarceration there were no more canonical Ripper murders. Coincidence? Well, it certainly could be. But the Joseph Levy connection does make for a more compelling case. Even here though, Casebook's official information won't commit to their relationship, despite this being almost certain. There is a book on this suspect which I understand does prove that they were cousins. The motive is also compelling, given that his life was destroyed by syphilis. However, as far as I know, no one with syphilis has ever been known to rip up women, grudge or not against the common source of that disease. But there's always a first time. My main reason for doubting Jacob Levy, apart from my obvious championing of an alternative, is that he literally went bonkers, to the extent that he lost control of his life. I think he would have been caught in the act. He wouldn't have had the wherewithal to so successfully trap his victims and then disappear like a ghost. Moreover, the untreated disease presents its symptoms slowly over years, essentially debilitating the infected person gradually. He died in July 1891 and was likely to have had the disease for an extensive period, 10 or more years before he died. By 1888 his health would already be in free fall, I doubt he would have been capable of the Ripper crimes. He remains a plausible suspect though, I have to concede. It is even possible that Jacob was the man seen with Eddowes, which could have infuriated Joseph Levy, the real Ripper, and his assistant, Henry Harris. Casebook include a quote that Joseph Levy was referred to as a gentleman in the legal notice for his will. I'm not sure what the relevance is.
unless you're trying to whitewash him of course. The term gentleman in those days really just meant you were financially comfortable, which apparently automatically means you're beyond reproach. He certainly was fairly wealthy by his death. In today's money he was worth £220,000. He had retired by 1901, so may have been worth even more. Yes, he had his own business, but he was still just a humble Jewish butcher, after all. Incidentally, both Harris and Levy had servants living with them throughout their married lives. This isn't quite as grand as it seems, as it was not unusual for artisans and entrepreneurs to have a servant. They were a cheap commodity at the time. Nonetheless, there is no doubt that both were financially comfortable, despite where they chose to live. Harris was a furniture dealer in the 1880s, but like his father, probably dabbled in various things. And one of those things, that both Levy and Harris could have been involved with, is property, or more specifically, subletting. There is no hard evidence for this, it is essentially supposition. But that's nothing new when it comes to Ripper suspects, is it? It is a bit tenuous and probably coincidental, but worth mentioning I think. The unfortunate part of identifying Joseph Levy and Henry Harris as the Ripper, is their names. They are not exactly unique, Kosminski or Koloski would have been so much better. Well, they are what they are. So, how common were these names in Whitechapel and Aldgate in 1888? There isn't definitive answer to that, but if we look at the 1881 and 1891 censuses for Whitechapel, you would expect that to be fairly representative of the period in between. However, when we look at the electoral registers, which are conducted annually, there appear to be rather more than might be expected in the period of 1881 to 1891, which is the period of focus. On the 1881 census there are only two different adult Joseph Levies, while on the 1891, there are none at all. This anomaly is mainly due to the number of addresses that are associated with those names not seeming to match those on the censuses. The most likely reason would be people moving address regularly throughout the period, so it isn't as many people as it seems, just the same people swapping addresses. That is certainly possible. Some clearly stay at the same address throughout the period. The problem is we just don't know who they are. So, I eliminated as many as I could by checking against the censuses, plus cross-referencing the electoral registers to pick up those that have occupation at a particular address after Levy and Harris were dead. That's easier for Harris, as he died in 1904. What I did was plot on a map where these addresses were and it did reveal something odd. As can be seen, with Harris, there isn't a whole lot, but could still be relevant, here are the electoral registers and relevant census returns. Note that Harris isn't on the 1881 census for Whitechapel because he was living in Aldgate. As is evident, search results aren't entirely logical, so it is necessary to run quite a number of variants, so I haven't included all, as it gets incredibly tiresome. Also, note the few other Henry Harrises that meet the criteria are the wrong demographic to what is known about the Eddowes Henry Harris. With Levy there is some notable clustering, especially around Bucks Row, Durward Street on the 1899 map, and Burner Street. The yellow spots are the unaccounted addresses, the red spots the canonical murders and the white spots with red cross are the other potential ripper murders. I'm not saying this proves anything, because apart from anything else, these addresses were registered to Joseph Levy, not Joseph Hyam Levy. If he was responsible for any of these addresses, he would have to be leaving out the Hyam from his name, which it should be noted was the case on the 1881 and 1891 census. He might do this intentionally, if it was an illegal practice, like unofficial subletting. It is also important to note that much of the pre-1886 electoral records have been lost. Another possibility, which also applies to Harris, would be places they rented on occasions when their marriages were excessively strained and they didn't want family to know. It's possible. It's more possible than the naughty prince anyway. And, incidentally, 
the latter explanation could make sense for 111 Wentworth buildings. Perhaps Harris's father found out and persuaded them to move into his house, for the sake of propriety. Who knows? There are a few rules that need to be understood about the electoral registers, the criteria for voting in the 1880s was to be a male over 21 and paying rent over 10 pounds, until 1884, when it was lowered to 5 pounds. This means that only the head of household, the rent payer, went on the list, provided they were over 21 and a British citizen. Women weren't allowed to vote until 1918, but many appear in the list because they fulfilled the criteria, they just couldn't actually vote. So, technically, only males over 21 who were the head of household and paying a high enough rent were eligible. Trouble was back then, people did not have personal identification, so in reality, there was little control over who voted. But that's immaterial as far as the registers go. The point is, just because there is a Henry Harris or Joseph Levy on the census, doesn't mean they were eligible to be on the electoral register, which means there should be more matches on the censuses, than the electoral registers. Which seems to be the opposite of what we are seeing with Levy and Harris. There could be a variety of reasons for this, so unfortunately, it's not exactly cut and dried. The other thing to be aware of is that the electoral register forms were submitted by the individual, as opposed to being interviewed on the doorstep. So, errors were much less likely. In regard to 111 Wentworth Street as I mentioned in Part 1, there is no evidence or reason to suggest that the electoral register for 1889, that featured 111 Wentworth buildings, could have been confused with the street. The modern image shows they are well separated. Yes, in the 1901 census, there is a Henry Harris at 111 Wentworth Street but he was too young to be the one on the 1888 electoral register. The address is absent from the 1891 census, possibly it was not in use, or was a public house, just as it is today, businesses were not always recorded. The original Victorian building survives to this day. There was practically no chance of any confusion. There are very few entries for 111 Wentworth buildings, this may be because a lot of the tenants were foreigners. The tenement was a good place to be anonymous. As I mentioned in Part 1, it appears that a lot of the electoral registers for Whitechapel were lost in some catastrophic flood a long time ago, however the 1887, 1888 and 1889 registers did survive relatively intact, but there are gaps. It seems that the older ones were most affected. 1890 onwards seemed to be largely unaffected. It is worth noting that on the morning of Edo's murder, after the police found her body, they started a door-to-door -door inquiry, which took them all the way to Joseph Levy's house. Levy was interviewed and did admit to being in Duke Street. I think it would be difficult for him to lie, as his wife would no doubt be within earshot, so he effectively cornered himself. He gave them Lawen's address in Dalston. It is unclear what happened with Harris, but he went to a police station to give his statement, so he was not interviewed that night. It is unknown what address the police had for him. Before I launch into presenting more proof for the associations demonstrated in Part 1, I just want to look at the two later cases, and the case generally considered to be the first possible Ripper murder. The Emma Elizabeth Smith attack involved three men, so could La Wendt have been involved there? She described one man to be young, about 19. La Wendt was over 40, but did have a young-looking face, so in the dark and extremely stressed, could Emma have mistaken La Wendt for the young attacker she described? Of course, that could have been someone else that Levy and Harris happened to be with. They would not come forward because they would implicate themselves. Or maybe this was just an unrelated attack. The first of the later murders I am covering is Francis Coles, who was murdered on February 13, 1891. That's 18 months after Alice Mackenzie. Coles was found dead in Chamber Street in South Whitechapel, as identified in the electoral register map. It's a possible ripper crime. The last is Carrie Brown, who was killed in her apartment in New York, 
in the U.S. of A., on April 24, 1891. There was some minimal dissection and the uterus was removed and left on the bed. So, there are similarities, although Scotland Yard were not convinced at the time. Possibly because she was strangled first, so not the Ripper's signature. It just so happens that a Henry Harris of the correct age sailed to New York from Liverpool on the SS Arania, which arrived there on April 20, 1891. Such a ship could make that journey in six to seven days, so Henry Harris could have been in London to be entered into the 1891 census and still make it to Liverpool in time to catch that ship. Unfortunately, we only know this Henry Harris's age, which does tally. There were quite a few Henry Harrises in Britain in 1891, but when narrowed down by age, we get less than 200. Of those, not all would be likely to be traveling to New York, whereas, the Ripper Henry Harris could conceivably have done so. The odds are against it, but it's another coincidence, if nothing else. This could fit if we imagine that Harris was trying to emulate Levy. The same might be said of the Alice Mackenzie murder, which was in an alley that literally ran behind the backyards of some of the houses in Newcastle Street. I don't want to speculate about who did what in which murder, as it doesn't particularly matter. In the case of Mary Kelly, which has the appearance of an overindulgence on the part of the Ripper, it could have been either or both. There is a school of thought that Joseph Barnett, her lover and possible pimp, may have been responsible, making it look like a Ripper murder. While that is possible, it seems a bit extreme. Barnett was suspected at the time, the police did investigate him pretty comprehensively. Personally, while I agree he could have killed Kelly, I don't see him as the Ripper, though some certainly do. I agree he should be a suspect though. Joseph Lawend, a Polish Jew, arrived in Whitechapel sometime around 1871, along with his brother Leopold. He married in 1873 and lived at 2 Tenter Street South, in South Whitechapel, from about 1877 to 1887. His brother Leopold lived next door at 3 Tenter Street South. His brother remained at that address until he died in 1900. From 1888 to 1891 Lawend lived at 45 Norfolk Road in Hackney. Then 23 Upper Street in Islington, until about 1895, when he moved to 116 Mild May Road in Dalston, and 140 Mild May Road from 1897 to at least 1901. By 1911 he was living at 17 Wallace Road in Highbury, but soon moved to 16 Mild May Park in Dalston, where he stayed until his death in 1925. Joseph Levy spent most of his life in or around Petticoat Lane, or Middlesex Street as it was officially known from 1840. He was born in Aldgate in 1842 and lived at 36 Petticoat Lane until his marriage in 1866 to Amelia Lewis. Unlike Harris, he was married in a private Jewish ceremony at 38 Mansell Street in South Whitechapel. Joseph was already living at 1 Hutchinson Street, where he and his wife remained until 1901. He retired from butchery and settled at 124 Mild May Road in Dalston, close to La Wend, where he stayed until his death in 1914. His wife died in 1912 in Brighton in Sussex. I don't know why that was, but perhaps they had finally separated. Of course, there could be a completely innocent explanation. Levy's parents lived at 36 Petticoat Lane from at least 1841. His father Hyam, died in 1872. His mother stayed in Petticoat Lane until at least 1881, but subsequently moved to 60 London Road in Southwark, in South London, by 1891. Levy's wife, Amelia Lewis, was born in 1842 in Aldgate. The family lived with her grandfather, Aaron Lyons, incorrectly given as Henry in 1861, until at least 1857, at 24 Mitre Street, then 20 Mitre Street until 1861, when they moved next door at number 21. Amelia was living at her grandfather's home until at least 1861. She was resident at her parents' address in 1866 when she married, 
which was 21 Mitre Street. Her parents, Anne Lyons and Philip Lewis married in 1840 in St. Mary's White Chapel. Anne Lyons was born in the St. James Duke's Place District, which was where Mitre Street was, while Philip was born in St. Mary's White Chapel. For most of 1841 to 1884, Amelia's family lived in Mitre Street, in 1851 to 61 at number 20 and 24, and from 1861 to 1871 at 21 and 24. It is a complicated picture though, with Amelia living in her grandfather's home, along with her uncle, Henry Lyons, in 1861, at 24, Mitre Street. Lyons is a name that turns up quite a lot in Aldgate. Her father was a Jewish fruiterer, and specifically, an orange dealer, which makes sense, as St. James Place was known as the Orange Market. From 1873 until 1884, Philip Lewis is associated with 17 Mitre Street, which I believe was used as a shop. However, the 1881 census has someone else living at 17 Mitre Street, while 21 to 23 Mitre Street are unoccupied, with Amelia's uncle, Henry Lyons, still living at 24 Mitre Street. Her brother Moss married Rachel Joseph, known as Ray, in 1880. They appear on the 1881 census living in Paddington. Strangely, Amelia's parents and brother Henry, cannot be found on the 1881 or 1891 census, and her parents, ever again. They may have emigrated to the U.S. However, her brother Moss Lewis continues the association with 17 Mitre Street from 1885 to 1893. What happened to the rest of her family is a mystery. The UK records show no hint of them. Nothing. Moss reappears on the 1911 census living at 69 Brushfield Street in Spitalfields. I believe Henry Lewis, Amelia's brother, appears on the 1891 census, along with Henry Lyons, at 402 Brixton Road Lambeth. So, what exactly the continuing association, up to 1893, with Mitre Street was, is unclear. A lot of Levy, Lewis, Lyons and Harris surnames turn up in the 1881 and 1891 census for Mitre Street. It seems likely that at least some of these were related to Joseph Levy, and possibly Henry Harris. Henry Harris, a Jewish furniture dealer, and general dealer, was born in 1843 in Whitechapel, probably in Golston Street. His mother, Esther Levy, was living at 15 Golston Street when she married Joseph Harris in 1840. They were living in Golston Street, on the eastern side, at the 1841 census, no numbers are given. It's not known whether Esther had any connection to Joseph Levy's family. In 1851 they were living at 28 New Street in Aldgate, which ran on from the end of Hutchinson Street. For some unknown reason, the family moved to Lambeth in South London, as recorded in the 1861 census. By 1871, they had moved back to Whitechapel and were living at 35 Gun Street, which is very close to Dorset Street. On the 1881 census, they were living at 15 Princes Street, which is the next parallel street to Hanbury Street, in fact, their house would have been more or less in alignment with 29 Hanbury Street and may have overlooked it. Note that this was one of the worst areas to live, in Whitechapel. It is not known where they lived between 1881 and 1886. But in 1887 they appear to be living at 34 Newcastle Street, also confirmed by the 1890 and 1891 register, for 1889 and 1890, and the 1891 census. Strangely, he is not listed on the 1889 register, for 1888. The 1889 register does feature a Joseph Harris, but this is a different person, as is proved by the 1881 census, this Joseph Harris appears in the registers throughout 1872 to 1889. I think it is reasonable to presume they were living at 34 Newcastle Street in 1888 because it makes logical sense, if they were there in 1887, and 1889 onwards. I cannot find any entry for 34 Newcastle Street on the 1889 register, 
so the likely reason is simply an omission of some sort. Both Henry and his father were living at 34 Newcastle Street until their respective deaths in 1896 and 1904. Harris's wife was Rebecca Benjamin, born in Shoreditch in 1844 to Angel Benjamin and Elizabeth Mosley, known as Betsy. It is not known when they married, but it was likely about 1840. It may not have been registered, as they were Jewish and registration was not being enforced at that time. Angel was born in Long Alley in Finsbury in about 1818. Betsy was born in 1814 in Whitechapel. In 1851 their address was 2 Cobbs Yard, Spitalfields, off Middlesex Street, not far from Goulston Street. By 1861 they were living at 10 Petticoat Square, Aldgate, where they stayed until at least 1871, probably 1875, when Angel died, or 1881 when Betsy died. Rebecca had a number of siblings, many of whom I could not trace. Her brother, Samuel, born 1840, married Sophia Harris in 1861, it is not known whether she was in any way related to Henry Harris. Samuel seems to have been known as Lewis, his first child was named Lewis. In 1871 he was living in Rosetta Place, off Frying Pan Alley, in Spitalfields, which is another location near Dorset Street. By 1881, and until his death in 1896, he lived in the Mile End. Another brother, Moss, or Moses, was born in 1847 and married Alice Abrahams in 1867. He seems to have lived at 32 and 33 Newcastle Place from at least 1871, until about 1885. By 1891 he was also living in the Mile End. Now we return to Henry's family. His sister Rebecca, born in 1847, married Ezekiel Moss in 1869 at the Great Synagogue in Duke Street, they were living at 10 Wentworth Street. In 1871 they were living in Bethnal Green, but by 1881 had moved back to Whitechapel and were living at 78 Commercial Street in Spitalfields, which was almost directly opposite Dorset Street. In 1886, they were living at 14 Stewart Street, Spitalfields, off Artillery Street, close to Dorset Street and Hanbury Street. One small side note. Harris's marriage certificate has a witness called Morris Lyons, possibly a relative of Amelia Lewis's family, who had a brother, Henry Lewis. The 1877 and 1878 electoral registers, for 1876 and 1877, show that they may have been living close to each other in St. George Street. If so, this could mean Harris had a familiarity with that area. However, there is no indication that Morris Lyons or Henry Lewis were living there in 1888 or later. St. George Street, now the A1203, will come up again for Lechmere, because it is close to Chamber Street where Francis Coles was murdered. I think it's worth noting that Levy's father died in 1872, aged 61, and Harris's mother in 1883, aged 62. These early deaths may have affected them and could have put further strain on their marriages. Whatever happened to Levy's wife's parents is unknown, but they certainly were not around to support her in the late 1880s. That closes the case for the prosecution. Whether you think they could be guilty or not, I would hope you would agree that they should at least be suspects, and a lot more information disseminated about them. But, as I have been at pains to say, they are not the only credible suspects, hiding in plain sight, to not get fair coverage. This is particularly true of Charles Lechmere aka, Charles Cross. In this case, jacktheripper.org have a fairly good account of the suspect, I suggest looking that up yourself. Also, check out Wikipedia. However, casebook.org only lists Lechmere as a witness, but do make the comment that he has been mooted as a potential suspect of the murder of Mary Ann Nichols. What are they afraid of? Whoever murdered Nichols was the Ripper, so why skirt around it? However, there is a very lengthy dissertation about Lechmere, but it ends rather disappointingly, 
by totally dismissing Lechmere as a suspect. While I do give credit to jacktheripper.org, there is more they could add. In researching Lechmere, I did not read any books or watch any videos specifically in relation to him as the Ripper, although I did see a TV documentary that featured Lechmere, many years ago. So, I started with Wikipedia and then just did a little digging myself. One detail regarding the suspect that particularly annoys me about the Ripperology Collective, is they insist on listing him as Charles Cross first, Lechmere second, it should be the other way around. Still, at least his real name is now well known, so Ripperology can't avoid that anymore. Cross was not his name, that was a lie, which has rightly added to the suspicion towards him. He should have been suspect number one in 1888, especially after the very next Ripper murder was in Hanbury Street. Lechmere claimed to work for Pickford's as a carman. He stated that he walked to the Pickford's Broad Street Depot each morning, which was in Aldgate. This could involve walking the whole length of Hanbury Street, although this may not have been the shortest route. Annie Chapman was murdered in the backyard of 29 Hanbury Street, which would have been near the latter end of the Hanbury Street walk. However his actual route isn't known and there are a number of possible alternatives. All we know is that he stated it took 40 minutes, he also claimed to be running late that morning, otherwise he would have been further along his route by the time of Nichols' murder. At the time of Nichols' murder, he had only recently moved to 22 Doveton Street, from 20 James Street. The route to Broad Street was longer from Doveton Street. You would think he would find somewhere a bit closer to Broad Street, if that was his daily destination, not somewhere further away. Side note, on the Pickford's website, they have a high-quality image supposedly of the depot entrance. I haven't inquired, but it looks mocked up in my opinion. It implies a back alley access from Brick Lane, which was impossible. Pickford's also had a warehouse in George Yard, where Martha Tabram was killed, and a building in Swan Yard, which had originally been a livery shop, probably used as an office. That location is now 15 to 25 Osborne Street, which was around a block from George Yard. It would have made more sense if Lechmere started work at one of those locations, but presumably they stabled their horses in Broad Street. There are other non-residential addresses associated with Pickford's in Whitechapel and elsewhere, which by 1888 had been in the hands of the Baxendale family for a long time. I also looked at where Lechmere had lived prior to and after the crimes. In 1888 he had recently moved to 22 Doveton Street, which was just outside of Whitechapel in the Mile End, he lived there until at least 1891. This is why his route to work took him through Bucks Row at that time, whichever Pickford site he was going to. Oddly, by 1901, he had moved to 24 Doveton Street, more interestingly, his occupation was then railway agent Carmen, although that could still be for Pickford's. He was born in the Strand, St. Anne Soho District, in 1849, but wasn't baptized until 1859. His parents were from Hereford. The earliest London address I could find was in 1859, when they were living at 14 Lyons Square, St. Dunstan Stepney, south of the Mile End Road, an area not far from Bucks Row. It appears that his parents parted sometime soon after that. His father was present for his 1859 baptism, but by 1861 his mother, Maria Louisa Rolson, was living with the Thomas Cross, a police constable at 13 Thomas Street, St. George's in the east, south of the Commercial Road East. This is when he gained the Cross alias. On the 1871 census, his mother is given as a Maria Cross, a widow, which probably wasn't true. In 1870, he married Elizabeth Bostock and was living in Marianne Street, St. George's in the East, again on the south side of the Commercial Road East, close to Pynchon Street where a woman's torso was found in September 1889. In 1872, his mother remarried, as Maria Cross, to Joseph Forsdyke, in Bethnal Green, possibly Big Hermesley. In 1873, 
he was living at 3 and Cliff Street, St. George's in the east, on the north side of the Commercial Road East, close to the Jubilee Street intersection. By 1875-76, he was living near his mother at 12 Mary Ann Street, but from 1878 to 1888 he lived at 20 James Street, which is quite close to Pynchon Street. From 1877 to 1883 his mother lived at 23 Pynchon Street. His stepfather, Joseph Forsdyke was living at 1 Mary Ann Street during 1883 to 88, it's unknown whether his mother was also there. Forsdyke died in 1889. By 1891, Lechmere's mother was living in St. George's Street, south of Cable Street. I have to admit that the more I learned of Lechmere's geography, the more suspicious he looked. Not only that, his job would likely mean that he had a good knowledge of the Whitechapel area. Another suggestive side note is that according to the 1891 census, his mother was a horse flesh dealer. It is unknown when she started that delightful practice, but it could have been any time after 1881. Incidentally, Chamber Street, where Francis Coles was killed in 1891, wasn't very far from St. George's Street. I cannot comprehend why anyone would not accept that there is a notable circumstantial case against Lechmere. Sure, he wasn't Jewish of course, but there's no tangible proof that the Ripper was Jewish. Some have suggested he may have used his occupation of a horse and cart driver to carry out his crimes. The times of the murders don't really tally with that and there is no witness testimony that ever mentioned a horse and cart. So, it would have been in his spare time, except for Nichols. He certainly had local knowledge, but we don't know what the extent of that was. Conversely, given he had as many as ten children in 1888, would he have had time? He had a total of 11 children, two of which had died by 1911. I'm not aware of any serial killers that had substantial families, some have had children, but not a football team's worth. The same could be said of Lawend, although I am not suggesting Lawend was the Ripper, and Jacob Levy, who could have been. That's not exactly a scientific analysis though. In conclusion, Charles Allen Lechmere has to be a serious consideration for the Ripper. He is undoubtedly a suspect of significance, despite any misgivings. Coming back to Jacob Levy, as I have already mentioned, he was closely related to Joseph Levy and he ended up in an insane asylum, due to an advanced syphilis infection. Only the Coles murder occurred after he was committed. So, like Kosminski, there is an apparent justification for their being the Ripper. That is debatable, as I have already stated. So little is known of Kosminski, the case is pure supposition. But, there is much more to connect Jacob Levy. He was born in about 1856. His father was a butcher and the family lived at his shop premises in 111 Middlesex Street from at least 1861, until at least 1881. It's worth noting that Joseph Hyam Levy's brother, Naphtali, lived at 118 Middlesex Street in 1871. Jacob married Sarah Abrahams in 1879. Guess where the ceremony was? Yes, the Great Synagogue, in Aldgate. In 1881 he was living at 11 Fieldgate Street in South Whitechapel, incorrectly given as Joseph on the census, which was quite close to George Yard and Berner Street. He was, of course, a lifelong butcher. He was sentenced to 12 months imprisonment in 1886 for receiving, and I believe his father died the same year, while his mother died in 1888, all of which certainly could have affected him psychologically. His parents cannot be found on the census after 1881, nor can they be definitely identified in the electoral rolls after 1882. The 1881 census records them at 7 Globe Road in the Mile End. Jacob similarly cannot be pinned down until 1890, when he had his butcher's shop at 69 Middlesex Street. In 1888, he could have been living in Goulston Street, either at 29 Wentworth Buildings or 183 Brunswick Buildings, but that is far from certain, though obviously intriguing. Interestingly, 
On the 1891 census it appears that his wife initially stated she was a widow, Jacob was still alive at that point, but in the insane asylum. At this time, she was running the business. It is unclear what happened after this, but she does appear on the 1911 census, living in South Whitechapel and is no longer a butcher. Casebook do include Jacob Levy and provide a good overview, but not all details are included, for example, Jacob's family and in-laws. His wife's parents lived in Bull Court in 1871. More interestingly, they lived in Grey Eagle Street in 1881, not far from 29 Hanbury Street. By 1891 they were in Montague Street, near Bull Court. Jacob's sister, Hannah, appears to have married a Henry Cohen in 1868. They are living at Six Horseshoe Place, or Court or Alley, at the 1871 and 1881 census. Although I could not confirm it, they may have been living at 24 and 26 Hanbury Street during 1886 to 1890, which if true, is very significant, as 29 is literally opposite 30, so 24 and 26 are diagonally opposite of a narrow street. One of his brothers, Isaac, who seems to have married a Clara Marks in 1873, was living at 130 Golston Street in 1891. Prior to this he was living in the Mile End Road, I don't know when he moved to Golston Street. There is certainly more research needed for Jacobs and his wife's families. I think, all things considered, Jacob Levy does make a very compelling ripper suspect. He did have nine children though, and if he had been syphilitic for an extensive period, wouldn't his wife and most of his children also have been infected? His wife does appear on the 1911 census, with three children still at home, with only two of their seven children having died. The only treatment for syphilis in the 19th century, was mercury. Physicians of the time weren't exactly knowledgeable about diseases and there are things that can be mistaken for syphilis, such as genital herpes, which can lead to viral meningitis. Whatever Jacob was suffering from, ironically it was probably the mercury treatment that caused his poor health and insanity, which seems to have progressed over a relatively short period. In 1891, Jacob's unfortunate wife was trying to maintain the butcher business, but by 1911 was living in the delightful Grace's Alley, off Well Street, which runs of the end of Lehman Street, as she was no longer a butcher. Jacob Levy certainly could have been the ripper, could his wife have known anything? Towards the end of the video, I will make a suggestion that could strengthen the case against Jacob Levy. Conjecture, of course, but intriguing. One last footnote in regard to casebook.org's article on Jacob Levy, following the Joseph Levy quote ending I'm off, it mentions that he also said the court should be watched, it states affirmatively that court meant mitre square. What is the source for this interpretation? I genuinely don't know. The quote is accurate, but its meaning is unknown to me, I hope that's not an assumption being presented as though it is a fact. While it's a plausible assertion, this should be noted as conjecture, or a citation given. If it is factual, what kind of person would call Mitre Square the court? Someone very familiar with it, perhaps. Someone who knows the Ripper won't kill another woman in that location, like the Ripper? Speculation, of course, but why not? Joseph Barnett was certainly a suspect for the Mary Kelly murder. He was certainly a frequenter of the area where many of the crimes occurred, but there's not a lot to verifiably connect him to any of the other cases. He should be on the list, nonetheless, because he had a definitive connection to a victim and was a suspect at the time. Severin Klosowski, or George Chapman, as he is better known, liked to kill women with poison and was named as a suspect by the famous Ripper detective, Inspector Abilene. Klosowski did work as a barber at a shop on the corner of George Yard in 1890. Casebook consider this to be significant, even though Martha Tabram was murdered in 1888. He apparently had a barber's shop at 126 Cable Street in 1888, but that's hardly near the epicenter of the crimes, though close to some significant locations. So, 
why are none of the more notable facts I have included in this video for other possible suspects, not considered significant. There really isn't much to connect this miscreant to the Ripper murders. Criminologists don't tend to link a poisoner with the type of crimes committed by the Ripper. The very fact that he is known to have murdered women with poison, almost certainly counts him out. A relatively new suspect, to my knowledge, at least, is Hyam Hyams. He appears on casebook.org. He was another lunatic who ended up in an asylum a number of times, though was not permanently there in the relevant period and could have committed most of the murders, and certainly the canonical five. He did eventually die in an asylum in 1913. Interestingly, the case book article actually tells us something about Joseph Hyam Levy that isn't mentioned in his own section on case book, and that's the Amelia Lewis connection to Mitre Street. Which proves they are well aware of it and have been for a very long time. Hyams appears to have been released from the asylum to appear on the 1891 census with his wife, living in New Street in Aldgate. Casebook claimed that this entry must have been a falsification on the part of his wife, wishful thinking on her part, because he never left the asylum after his admission in January 1890, as indicated by a second appearance on the 1891 census as an inmate of Colney Hatch Asylum. I am not sure about this 1891 census double entry. Unless the asylum records state his wife's name, then it may not be the same person. Unfortunately, there is no searchable entry in the marriage register that relates to a Hyam Hyams and a Rachel. And, it doesn't even add anything to the theory anyway. I will say this though, the census was still conducted at the doorstep in 1891, so there would be no reason to admit her husband wasn't home that day, if she was filling in the form months in advance, you could understand it, but that was not the case, so why pretend he was there? I will concede it is possible, nonetheless. According to Case Book, this Hyam Hyams lived at 29 Mitre Street in 1871 and 1881 and his mother moved to 24 Mitre Street by 1891. And as previously covered, there is a connection for that address to Joseph H. Levy, although this is somewhat moot point given his primary connection. All of this is correct. Except, this is a different Hyam Hyams to the one who landed in the insane asylum. This is a basic research failure. When I started working on this, I immediately spotted a potential mistake. The censuses feature a number of Hyam Hyams. The 1891 census lists three living in the relevant area. One is married to Aaliyah and can be discounted as he also appears on the 1901 census. The second is the New Street one, married to a Rachel, incidentally, I could not trace her after this, which could be consistent with her husband being in an asylum. However, there is the third Hyam Hyams, this one is married to a Rose and he is a fruit terror. He also appears on all censuses from 1861 through 1911. The Hyam Hyams living at 29 Mitre Street in 1881, is also a fruit terror. I instinctively saw the connection, even though on the 1891 census he is living at 232 Jubilee Street, Mile End. He cannot be the insane Hyam Hyams. Now, sometimes, the obvious conclusion can be wrong, so is it imperative to check, where possible. Thankfully, the 1882 marriage of Hyam Hyams to Rose Ahrens was in the register and I obtained the certificate. You will note that their address is given as 29 Mitre Street, Hyam is a fruit terror and his father is Solomon, who was deceased. Solomon died in 1878. Furthermore, the 24 Mitre Street connection to his mother in 1891 can, by extension, be connected to the same Hyam Hyams because his name appears in the tax records and electoral register at this address for 1887 to 1891. In case you're wondering, there is no conflict with the 1891 tax record and the 1891 census, the tax records were often out of date, so it is possible that he moved late enough in 1891 to appear on these two separate records. Further indirect evidence is that Fanny Hyams appears in the tax records for 29 Mitre Street until 1888, 
so probably moved to her son's home at 24 Mitre Street around 1888. Now here's the cherry, the casebook article makes reference to a Louis Levy being resident at 8 Mitre Street in 1861 and that he was Hyam's uncle, because his mother was a Levy. Which means that this connection could now potentially be transplanted onto Joseph Hyam Levy. I have no doubt Levy and Hyams would have known each other, they were fellow Jews and Hyams lived where Levy's in-laws did. However, 1861 is 27 years before the Ripper, so possibly, just another coincidence? Even Casebook acknowledged that. I don't know whether Lewis and Fanny Levy were related to Joseph, but it's certainly possible. In any case, this connection is irrelevant to the hypothesis that the insane Hyam Hyams was the Ripper. I think this exercise tells us quite a lot about the mindset of Casebook.org. Only, this time, it has backfired. Incidentally, or coincidentally, there is an H. H. Hyams in the tax records, he is linked throughout the period to 5 Duke Street, or 5 Hanover Court, which runs off and behind Duke Street, and to 20 and 21 Mitre Street on one occasion. It is possible that both Duke Street addresses are in fact the same location. However, Casebook should not get excited because this character is actually Henry H. Hyams. A side note to Hyams' 1882 marriage, they married at the Prince's Street Synagogue, Henry Harris's parents lived in Prince's Street, according to the 1881 census. Probably just another coincidence. Probably. With all that said, what about the insane Hyam Hyams? Well, he is still a potential suspect, though probably just another nutcase on the loose, along with all the others. Meanwhile, Jack is doing his thing, unseen, and hiding in plain sight. But there is suspicious circumstantial evidence against him, note, circumstantial, nothing else. Nonetheless, the 217 Jubilee Street address is quite a coincidence, but the only one really. However, 218 was probably on the opposite side to 217, not next door as casebook claim. Close, but not that close. These properties no longer exist, but most of Jubilee Street's Victorian houses survive and there is no reason to assume the numbering has changed. Another coincidence is of course that the St. Hyam Hyams was living at 232 Jubilee Street in 1891, which probably was approximately opposite to 217, albeit an irrelevance. And, it should be said that Jubilee Street wasn't exactly the epicenter of the Ripper crimes, but closest to Bucks Row. The other address associated with the insane Hyam Hyams was Bell Court Lane in 1888. I'm not sure where this was, but may have been off the Whitechapel Street or Road. Still, without the bogus Mitre Square connection, the case is significantly weakened anyway. It is possible that the insane Hyam Hyams lived at 29 Golston Street in the late 1870s, for what it's worth. In conclusion, Casebook's Hyam Hyams article conveniently reinforces Joseph Hyam Levy as a witness. Perhaps that's why they like it? It would explain the faux pas. Or maybe it's just incompetence, neglect, or something along those lines. So, why can't the Levy-Harris duo be suspects too? And if this doesn't convince you, nothing will. I jest of course. There is just one other supposed suspect I would like to touch on, and that is Mary Piercy. I covered her bloody murder of a love rival in my first video on my channel, it was the first case I chose. I think I can honestly say that even Prince Edward Victor is a more convincing suspect than Mary Piercy. As far as I can tell, the only justification for this I can see is that she cut her victim's throat, albeit after beating her half to death with various implements, in a catfight that got out of hand. But, Casebook.org and JackTheRipper.org consider her a valid suspect, and I believe there is even a book. Really. In my final plea for the prosecution against Henry Harris and Joseph Hyam Levy, I present the murder map one last time, this time including the Stewart Street address I previously missed off. Draw your own conclusions.
One question we might ask in regard to suspects who did not die or became incarcerated, is why did they stop? That is a very open-ended question, there could be a great many reasons. There is one that should not be overlooked though, and that is the fear of being caught. Some serial killers subconsciously want to stop, often deliberately leaving clues, but few want to be caught. If they know the gig's up, they will sometimes just stop for the sake of self-preservation. Possibly, after the obscenity of the Kelly murder, the police presence became too much, maybe they were warned off by someone in the know, or who strongly suspected them. It could make sense. The Alice Mackenzie, Francis Coles, and Carrie Brown murders, assuming they were the Ripper, were a little half-hearted for old Jack. Perhaps they lost their compulsion through fear of ignominy, and if they were Jewish, fear for their families, friends, and the whole community, or just lost their nerve. With Levy and Harris, these later murders may have been the work of Harris alone, who was not a butcher, in the professional sense, at least. Obviously, Carrie Brown would have to have been Harris. Serial killers have been known to work in teams, and they can stop for extensive periods for a variety of reasons. That's based upon the ones we know of. Many serial murders come to an end and the culprit is never identified, so we never know why they stopped. Generally speaking, they only get caught when they don't stop. There's an inevitability about pushing your luck too far. I think it is also important to realize that just because someone was considered as a potential suspect back in 1888 and later, by police, or anyone else, closer to the time, doesn't make them a better suspect today. In fact, if they identified anyone as a potential suspect while the murders were ongoing, they kept an eye on them, which may actually prove them less likely to be the Ripper. How often does the perpetrator of a murder not even appear on the police radar, many have only been caught decades later using DNA? And how often does a perpetrator masquerade as a witness, hiding in plain sight? The nature of the Ripper crimes is often cited as unique, but this is only true up to a point. Dismemberment is not unique at all, however, usually, this is something the perpetrator does in their safe space and the body parts stored disposed of, or even eaten. The thing that makes this case stand out is that the butchery took place in mostly outdoor residential locations, where the bodies were found, usually not long after the attacks. I don't believe this was because the attacks were necessarily spur of the moment. More likely the victims were lured to where they were killed because the Ripper was familiar with the location, and in particular, the lighting. It could even be that in most of the cases, specific locations were loosely planned ahead. Nonetheless, that doesn't make them any less audacious, because, in all cases, even Mary Kelly, there was a grave risk of being caught in the act. The Hanbury Street location is particularly bizarre, this murder also took place later in the morning than any of the others, perhaps the Ripper was determined to use that location. It's possible there were many other occasions when the Ripper attempted to lure their victim to a given location, but failed to do so, having to abandon that night's hunt. Having an assistant as a lookout would make the murders less risky than they otherwise appear. The most important assumption is that the Ripper did not have a safe place to commit their crimes, either because they lived with family in an environment that would not allow for them to be able take the victims to their home, or because they lived in lodgings of some sort or they were a vagrant. And, let's not assume that the Ripper did stop. Perhaps they changed their modus operandi out of necessity. The bodies of dead women turned up in the Thames on a regular basis in the Victorian period, sometimes just body parts. Then there is the Thames torso murders. Women of ill repute disappeared constantly and no one ever knew why, or sadly, much cared. In fact, that still happens. I have a final footnote to the case against some of the suspects. If the Ripper was Jacob Levy, or someone else known to Levy and or Harris, if Harris was living at 111 Wentworth Buildings, and they knew that, could the Grapito and the depositing of the apron piece have been a deliberate attempt to implicate Harris? Perhaps to deter them from coming forward. There is no evidence that they would have done so,
had the police not knocked on Levy's door, only minutes after the murder. This may especially be possible, if they realized that Levy and Harris had definitely seen them. I am almost certain that Jacob Levy would have known Joseph Levy, and by extension, Harris. It is also possible that Hyam Hyams would have known Levy and Harris, if only by sight. However, if that hypothesis is assumed to be possible, surely Henry Harris, and by extension, Joseph Hyam Levy, must also be considered suspects themselves. All conjecture, of course, but that's all we have. Websites like casebook.org may appear to be some sort of charitable service, but they do make money from their websites, whether directly through advertising revenue, or indirectly from the media industry connections that the website generates as a result of its success. It's not clear whether jacktheripper.org make money from advertising, they do recommend books that can be purchased from their site. This site is really just an extension of Jack the Ripper Tours, which is very much a money-making operation. This is evident from their Facebook page, which they link on their website, and their free ebook, which is essentially an advert for their tours. But even if they were non-profit, they would still have a responsibility to provide all relevant information and be open and as truthful as possible. They are not doing that. Why does Ripperology like to present voluminous expositions about suspects for which there is practically nothing known, while providing minimal coverage for suspects, and witnesses, where there is sometimes much more verifiable information, if not considerably more. Maps are a vital resource to understanding the geography of the Ripper world. So, you would think these websites would provide these in an easily accessible form. JackTheRipper.org have only a modern map, which doesn't help at all. Casebook do appear to provide maps, but in my view they are being deliberately unhelpful. You would think that their landing page, which has a nice group of links, a 4x4 block, but have an empty space, that would be the perfect place to put a link to their maps. However, conversely, it is not easy to find their maps and when you do, it won't help much. The one map with readable detail they do have is split into grid sections, such that it makes it exceedingly difficult to utilize in a meaningful way. One link is to an advert for a map book to purchase. There is nothing helpful in their maps, their so-called interactive map will not help you much. But there are a number of free map resources on the internet that they could guide you to, not least of all, the 1890 Booth Poverty Map. There are others that can be helpful, albeit they are from later, when there had been some changes to street names and layout, but, once you know what you're looking at, these are very helpful too. Of course, it is the publishing world that make the big money. There are certain high-profile authors who have made a living from the Ripper business. I have read many of their books and I know how they work, often drip-feeding information, interspersing it with other details, and generally making it hard to appreciate the most pertinent elements in their correct chronological context. And omit anything that doesn't fit their own particular narrative. Publishers tend to favor established authors, or celebrity authors, because they're easy to market. The most important thing for them is to maintain and continue the most profitable strategy, because they are businesses, that's what they do. Finally, while I am not endorsing the 2017 book that inspired this video, I will add a link to the book in the description if a lot of people ask for it in the comments. However, here is an image from the Amazon store. It is notably absent from Casebook's comprehensive book list. I imagine if they did include it, it would have a scathing review attached to it to dissuade anyone from looking at it. It wouldn't surprise me if some of the negative reviews it has received, originated from the Ripper Cooperative. While it is not perfect and does contain mistakes, the overall premise is entirely valid. I would give it 7 out of 10, especially given how cheap it is. It certainly doesn't deserve the 1 and 2 star ratings that some have awarded it, you have to wonder whether they actually read it properly, or have some bias going on. Well, if you have slogged through part 1 and part 2 and reached this point, thank you, and perhaps you would be kind enough to like and subscribe.
there may be a part 3 update, so, if anyone wants a full screen image, at maximum resolution, of any of the documents I have presented, please let me know in the comments and I will include those in a part 3, assuming there is sufficient interest for a part 3.